Coming up next on the SPNN Forum, I'll be speaking with Nathan Dungan, founder and president of Share, Save, Spend. That's next on the SPNN Forum. Welcome to the SPNN Forum. I'm John Forty. With me this week is Nathan Dungan, founder and president of Share, Save, Spend. Nathan, welcome. Good to be here, John. Thanks so much for having me. Um, before we get into Share, Save, Spend and all the other fabulous things you're doing, yeah. tell us a little bit about you. You weren't born in this state, were you? No, Waterloo, Iowa. Yes. Missed it by that much? Yeah, I know that much. <laughs> Spent one whole year of my life there. And then was a little uh, transient, uh, when I say transient, with my family as they were moving around the Midwest. Um, landed here for a while mm -hmm. um, in the 70s and then finished up my high school years down in Houston, Texas and then came back here to um, go to St. Olaf College and then from here out east to Philadelphia um, where I stepped into the world of financial services working for my mother who had her own financial advising firm out there uh, just outside of Philadelphia. And uh, so that is what kind of got me started on this journey around money. Well, actually, really before that in my childhood, but professionally, kind of vocationally, um, post-college. And were you a saver in your extreme youth? Did you, like, hide acorns? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. I was a saver. One of the things my parents did for us, I'm the youngest of four, so I have three older siblings. And one of the things my parents did for us is they were, I, I described kind of growing up in what I call the, the financial freak family, mm -hmm. and that my parents had, had just regular and routine conversations with us about money. Um, they, were, they were very uh, transparent about what was going on money-wise in our family. I, I have very vivid memories of my parents sitting at the kitchen table just kind of doing their bill thing and as we would come and go sort of in our home um, they would they would just invite us in and because we would you know natural curiosity hey mom or dad what are you doing and they would say oh well you know we're paying bills you know we're paying our mortgage we're saving for your college your college or vacation um, or a car or you know those kinds of things so it 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 they didn't mute our curiosity, which I think is a tendency to do in money with kids especially, mm -hmm. is sort of just push it away. Um, they just invited us into that conversation. And so what it led to is my parents, again, sort of uh, uh, foresight, which is we all got little allowances. Not a lot, um, but enough where we could start to practice with money. And so their um, really kind of requirement, but it was more just of a guidance for us, was, okay, here's an allowance. and. All we would ask is that you, you know, you get to sp spend some for yourself, cool, and save. And uh, they opened us op opened up bank accounts for us, and then share. And so they had some some expectations for us at a pretty early age that we were just doing those things. They didn't necessarily call it share and save and spend like we do today, but that was really my early sort of. Uh, forming and shaping around you know money and, and particularly money habits. So when you say the freak family, they were particularly ill-suited to like espionage because they weren't secret. <laughs> exactly. No, I right. I mean, I think that's what was so important when I say freak family because so few people can identify with my upbringing, and I'm not saying it was right. It was just different. And the fact that they had something inside of them that said, hey, let's step into this. And now that doesn't mean it was always like harmonious. I mean, I remember my parents having absolute disagreements about money, um, myself having disagreements with my parents around the choices I wanted to make with money. And yet, you know, they, they really, for the most part, kept it, you know, a pretty open book. We used to have family meetings to decide like, okay, where are we going to go on vacation? Here's how much we can afford. And we were kind of charged with some little tasks around doing some research for that. And that was kind of pre-internet days. So the good thing is they were just trying to be um, very kind of eyes wide open for us. Heading off to college, I mean, you know, this is a huge deal today for young people graduating in the U.S., average debt of almost $30,000 of student loans. You know, with us as we were kind of, even my oldest sister, the first one, I mean, I remember them having conversations with her about affordability, talking about student loans, and, you know, this was well before you could really do a lot of searching on it. So um, it was just a sensibility that they had, and, and um, you know, I think part of it is my dad is, you know, a retired Lutheran pastor now, so he had this sort of social lens, um, kind of the giving lens, and then my mom is a, in the financial services business, 
um, early on in, her, you know, in terms of her work years. And I think it was the blending of those things that gave us this kind of balance around how we think about money. And so you left the Midwest, or you left Pennsylvania and came back here. Did, yes, yeah, in uh, 1998. I was, um, uh, came back in 1998 to become the vice president of marketing um, and communications for what is now Thrive and Financial here in, in town. And so that was, a, that was a cool thing, and it was kind of taking some of what I did around money and values and really um, imparting that on a more national level. And uh, we did a tour of Around Money, if you remember that. Yes, we have a history, yes. We have a history, yeah, it's good. <laughs> and it was really awesome because it was kind of taking that show on the road and engaging young people, um, tweeners and teens, you know, around money and the role it plays in their life and getting a sense of, their, of the influence of the culture on money. So, um, yeah, it really was an impetus for me to step in more substantively around the topic. And then as, you know, they went through their merger in 02, it was kind of a spark for me to say, okay, it's time to jump out and really um, do something um, around this, what I felt and perceived as a um, overreach on the part of the consumer culture, particularly around shaping habits and values with kids and, and adults, but, but especially with youth. And at that time, you published your first book. I did, yeah. And so in, when I left in 02, I spent a year um, you know, writing and pleading with a lot of publishers <laughs> and getting a lot of rejection letters, um, which was actually important. Um, and, the, and it would kind of spark me to be more persistent even and not get, I mean, it was discouraging and it wasn't. And then um, the, John Wiley um, in, in 03 said, yeah, we love your concept. And so the first book that, pub, that I published and wrote in 2003 is called Prodigal Sons and Material Girls, How Not to Be Your Child's ATM, which is really kind of the first part of the book is uh, a real window into the consumer culture and just to what degree and what lengths they will go to shape habits and values. And uh, the second part of it is really more kind of a how-to, you know, how to step into these conversations, money conversations, practices and rituals you can undertake to um, sort of uh, instill, uh, you know, really healthy money habits and attend to your financial well-being. And the organization Share, Save, Spend, yes. you founded, yes. and it's not simply financial literacy, it's the emotional dimension, the social dimension, there's yes. so many aspects to this. Yes, it's really, I mean, I, I describe it, John, as, as really attending to financial well-being. So there's, a, of late, there's been a lot of research that's being done around the topic of well-being and happiness. Um, there was a book written uh, by that title called Well-Being by Tom Rath, who was former researcher at um, the Gallup Company's head mm -hmm. lead researcher. And they basically went all over the world and they they asked people of, of at, in developing countries and developed countries, you know, so what makes up kind of optimal well-being? And they came down to five categories, and one of those five is financial well-being. And so um, what it told us is that it's not just about learning kind of um, vocabulary about money. Um, that's fine and well. It's really more the practical, practical application. You know, if you're in a relationship with somebody, how do you enter into that with them and take on, you know, your money narrative, their money narrative, and how do you merge those kind of things together? Not right or wrong, just different, and what does that mean? If you have children, you know, what does it mean for them and maybe adult parents or other family members, friends? So it's, we're really looking at sure safe spend at the, at, we don't manage anyone's money, it's really around education, but more specifically financial well-being. You have the passion of an educator, but are you, are you aiming at kids too? Yeah, yeah, so I mean, our, our real audience is, is really adults, and yet a lot of things that we create are for individuals and, and families to more substantive, substantively step into the conversation, you know, of course, if they have children. And because no one really does that. Um, you know, when I always, when I ask people, you know, so particularly kids, if I'm not doing a multi-generational event, like I'll be doing in San Francisco in a few weeks, one of the things I'll ask them um, is, so where are you learning about money? Um, and, or what are you learning about money in school? And, some of most of them will say, I didn't really learn anything about money in school. And uh, so what I always say to that is it, it, it really takes the responsibility and, and it lands it squarely back at home. The challenge with that is most adults, most parents especially, they just don't really know what to do with that. You know, what I hear from them, the kind of the common refrain is, I want to talk about money. Um, you know, I want to get into that conversation with them. I have no idea what to say or where to start. And so that's really where we step in is to kind of not make any judgments about what people have or have not done, but just say, okay, let's take it where you're at 
and then step into the conversation more substantively. So you have like suggested little inroads about what yeah. you're doing with your allowance or sure. you have a job, where does that go? Exactly, so we really kind of look at it sort of on an age sort of uh, continuum, if you will, and, and also generational continuum. So it's, it's really to say, I mean, a lot of our work is really for multi-generations, and yet, you know, our, our real focus audience is really more adults. Um, and, you know, what does this topic around money mean for them? And, you know, helping them and inspiring them, hopefully motivating them to say, you know, if you have kids, it's so important to be stepping into this because if you, ab I always say, if you abdicate that role and don't step into it, there's a very willing teacher out there, and it's called the consumer culture. And they're actually really, um, to some degree, betting and also um, hoping and desiring that you you, you never step into that conversation because it gives them just complete un unfettered access to shaping habits and values and those kinds of things. And so, and they're really good at it and they're getting better all the time. And it's, it's really enveloping. Um, and when you understand, you know, things like brain development and, and how our, you know, things like deferred gratification and all those fun cerebral functions in the prefrontal cortex, how that sh they really shape our money habits and values. If you, it, once you're aware to that and on to that, you have a whole inspired kind of inspiration as a parent to want to step into those uh, forming and shaping kinds of conversations. And how do you feel about debt? Yeah, I personal mean, debt. Yeah, I mean, I think personal debt is is pretty normal for most people. You know, it's it's not unusual. Um, and um, I would also say that it's something you, you need to kind of take a pulse read on periodically. Let's take college, for example. I mean, it's a pretty freaky thing for a 17 or 18 year old to be thinking about this big journey, you know, off to college, you know, hopefully on some vocational path or further study path. And, you know, probably a big part of most of young people's decisions is taken on debt. And, you know, that's a pretty heady thought for a 17 or 18 year old who probably has never, m most of them, had any debt. And now you're talking about asking them to sign away on maybe multiple thousands of dollars of debt. So I think that the challenge is we're asking them to make really a very formed and adult kind of decision when they're not really even remotely prepared for that. So I think, you know, my feeling on debt, I mean, and just as that as an example is, um, the more that you can be honest with yourself, uh, you know, and think and feel and just what does it mean to take this on and do I have a plan for repayment? You know, again, this is optimal kind of, not optimal, but I think realistic scenario planning. Um, for example, I mean, a lot of people before the last economic downturn, before 2008, you know, very thoughtfully and wisely saved up for a home, purchased a home at the peak of the market through no fault of their own, and all of a sudden, boom, crash, it comes. So there they sit. They're underwater now financially, or, or they were, around their, you know, their um, piece of real estate. And, you know, what we know is that it leads to a, just an enormous amount of stress. And the other thing we know about stress, it's the number one cause of negative health outcomes. And guess what the number one source of stress is? Money. Yeah. And guess what a big part of that is? Debt. So when you understand that in, in kind of the full 360 of that, it's just really about being honest and saying, okay, when I'm going to take on this obligation, am I, am I ready for that? You know, if I'm in a relationship, are they ready for that? Are we being just being honest about what that means? This is something you care about deeply, and this is something I've always thought of you, is that there's a line between teacher and preacher, and you're always able to just lean a little more teacher than I am, because I want to go right into preacher and go, Dad, it's a toxin, don't do it! <laughs> right, and I think, I mean, I, I hear you on it, and I also would say that, you know, there's a lot of companies out there that are dangling sort of that debt carrot in front of you and really never talk about consequences. And so, I mean, eyes wide open for sure on that, and I think in the, in the latest downturn, I mean, we saw in terms of the the fines you know that were you know unfortunately not not enough people probably or should have you know that should have probably you know come up on trial whether or not they should have gone to jail jury to decide court to decide but I mean it, it was you know it was predatory you know without question so I mean I'm not saying be naive about that I but I'm also saying it is a it is kind of a normal function for most people you know whether they're gonna again try to go to college you know perhaps purchase a vehicle um, you know, a home someday, maybe start a business. I mean, that's just part of it. The key, though, is how do you manage it? And um, are you, I mean, I would say be much more conservative. Um, I mean, for example, my wife and I, we don't have any car debt. We have, you know, we do have some bit of a mortgage and we have a, a little bit of business debt to, you know, do some um, uh, products and tools that we're going to launch here this fall. But 
uh, all very eyes wide open. You know, we both, you know, understood we were stepping into and, you know, what the terms were of it and thought a lot about it. You know, we slept on it a long time before we make a decision to go do debt. So it's, it's really about being, it, you know, for it to be manageable for people. I always figure that it's, if, it, if the asset you are borrowing for is going to appreciate, then debt has a reasonable argument. Yes. You know, and that would be fair. basically, a home would be the obvious one, particularly with the tax subsidy. Yes. Um, business loan, possibly. Yes. And education. But with the education laws having changed, you literally can't refinance it. You're, no. locked at, you're locked up at that rate. Yeah, I mean, and that's what's been really unconscionable to me is the fact that we have not acknowledged. I mean, it's, trilli it's a trillion dollars. We have a trillion, we have one trillion dollars plus outstanding in student loan debt in this country. And m much of that debt, most of that debt is from the government, and they're making a lot of money on that debt. And so there's been a huge move inside of Congress, obviously, to step into that and say, we need to let them refinance this debt. I mean, any other kind of lender, you would be able to, you know, for the most part, mm -hmm. do that. And the, the fact that we lock them in on this, you know, for how many years running is unconscionable to me. I mean, we need to help students out. I mean, the other thing to take into consideration, I mean, without getting overly political, but what we've done to students in terms of to make education affordable, again, is unconscionable to me. It used to be a state school. You could go and you could kind of have a part-time job and for the most part, maybe even make enough money to pay a good bit of your tuition. That's not even feasible anymore. So we're, we're doing it to them. And the question is, what are we going to do to help, you know, on the other end of that? Now, the, a bit of good news is that they, they are allowing some, you know, alternate repayment structures based on kind of your job situation. But yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's, they're really up against the eight ball, which is why I encourage families before you sign on to student loan debt. Um, and that's the other challenge. It's very, student loans or going to college is very much about a brand familiarity. Um, so it, they're in the brand game just like, you know, pick, pick your uh, retailers in the brand game. And so, I mean, stepping back and, you know, getting your center on, on that decision and understand what it means is, is hugely important. And then there's the aspect of that student loan debt is not dischargeable in bankruptcy. Not. When the bankruptcy laws changed, they waved goodbye to that. And, you know, because that was all the banking people who said, you know, it's, and it's just, you know, to me it was, um, it was really unconscionable, you know, that we did that. Now, again, I think it's a two-way street. People who take on the debt need to know what they're signing on for. And I also think we could be more proactive and, you know, in helping people be, particularly because of the economic downturn. I mean, nobody was hurt worse in this downturn than recent college graduates. I mean, you know, they were coming out and they, there were no jobs or very few jobs. Their unemployment rate was almost double that of the national average. And their starting incomes were less than they were almost 10 years ago. So, I mean, it was like a perfect storm of horribleness, you know, stepping into that. So, yeah, I, I hear you on debt, and I, I think that it's just, you know, being thoughtful and being wise about how you manage it. I think the, the, the most basic elements of financial self-awareness, you know, are assets, debts, income expenses. Without question. And, and are you working the other three? How do you work the other three? Well, and I think, you know, to, to your point is, is, is uh, not only awareness around those things, um, and also um, being in conversation with those things, which is, again, if you're in a relationship, most people will say, I just don't know how to step into the money topic with a spouse because what happens is it gets really emotional. So when you, when you talk about a very, what, what should be a kind of a, um, a more of an analytical conversation, right underneath the surface of that is a lot of emotion. Mm -hmm. So you want to park the emotion, you know, you want to try to do that. And yet my experience with most couples has been that they're not able to really do that. And because what it feels like is you're judging me, you know, for this choice I made. Or it's the shame they bring forward or the fact that their money narrative from, you know, their childhood really didn't prepare them to be in that conversation. And so I think it's small steps of how do you step into those more, you know, I think really critical and important conversations, but do it in a way that honors each person's narrative and what they bring to the, to the conversation, right? In case you're just joining us, this is the SPNN Forum. I'm John Forty, and with me this week is Nathan Dungan, founder and president of Share, Save, Spend. So we were just talking about universities, and now you're starting one. Yes, yes, we are starting one. Yeah, good segue. Yeah, so for the last few years, you know, I've been really interested in so kind of my vocational hypothesis from early on in my kind of financial career is, so who and or what is shaping our money habits? Um, and why should we care? And what I've said earlier in the show is that our money habits are being hugely affected and impacted by the consumer culture. And so my, my read on that is, 
and, and what I hear from people is really, really smart people at all ends of the socioeconomic spectrum is, hey, we need help with this. We don't know how to step into this. So a few years ago, we kind of had this brainstorm is, you know, could we, um, we thought, thought there was a niche in helping people be, be more proactive in this space and step into their, you know, financial well-being, you know, and take ownership of their financial well-being. Again, didn't know how. So what we've created through Money Sanity U are short little vignettes. And it's a subscription tool, it's a su subscription uh, resource for organizations, both for-profit, non-profit, who are recognizing that financial well-being is really, is a really important topic uh, for a whole variety of reasons, not the least of which is productivity and stress and just general health and well-being, right? And so what we did is we created, um, we'll launch this fall, uh, Money Sanity U, with 50 plus little vi vignettes of about three to five minutes where we unpack a topic like couples and money secrets or values-based allowances or um, launching the boomerang generation, all the millennials who are kind of cycling back home. And so we unpack it for three to five minutes and then we give people a, a singular you know, action to step to take. Maybe it's a conversation, maybe it's a link to a site to go look at something, review something, better understand their credit score, you know, their credit report. So little by little, our, our objective is to get people more settled around this, this topic. And what we believe and our research would suggest is it actually matters. You know, helping people be in these kind of and curate some of these conversations for individuals, for families, um, means a lot. So yeah, we're really excited about it. But it's, yeah, it's been three years in the making and it's, um, we're, we're um, uh, it's it's a labor of love, put it that way. Okay. Yeah. Money Sanity You. Yes. Okay. And that's a name that you're going to be hearing more of in the future. Indeed. Yeah. Right. Yeah. A lot more of. Yes. Okay. Um, so when it comes to sanity, how much does emotional intelligence play into this? Yeah, a lot. A lot. And so to I alluded to just a moment ago, I've always been really curious about uh, families, you know, and how do families step into this topic of money? And several years ago, I was at a conference out in Seattle, and I met a gentleman by the name of Dr. Tim Kasser. And Tim is uh, at, on staff. He's the chair of the Department of Psychology at, at Knox College in Illinois. And he's one of the world's uh, foremost experts on the topic and the impact uh, of materialism on our lives. And so he's just done a phenomenal amount of research in that space. And what he knows is that if you don't, you know, we, we know all the negative kind of um, uh, byproducts of that. And he was always really curious about, is there any intervention tools, are there any intervention tools that help individuals and families be more you know, intentional in this space? So we collaborated, because that's what we do. We create tools to help individuals, families step into that space. So this, in particular, one was for families, parents and an adolescent. And so we did the research here back in 2008. We studied parents and kids for two years because we wanted to know like, what was going on in their head. Can you arrest? this sort of um, trajectory that they're on, uh, that, that they're on with respect to the inf influence of materialism. So it's a randomly assigned kind of study. Half the group and the parents got no intervention. They, the kids and the parents did surveys and the other half were in, received the intervention, which was um, three, three hour long workshops by me over the course of about a year and a half. Um, they got tools to take home, to, to build their vocabulary, to be more intentional in their conversations, and to essentially help them you know, take on and create new habits around money. So what we found at the end of this, which was quite interesting, is that uh, the parents uh, f felt it was enormously helpful for them to have tools to really guide their conversation. So that's what they really wanted most of all, mm -hmm. is help us guide the conversation and understand that there's a lot of emotion <laughs> underneath the conversation. The other thing we found, though, is that in the ki for the kids in the control group who received none, over the period of two years, we saw their self-esteem continue to decline and their um, amount of materialism measures continue to increase, right? So we saw the, which is exactly what you wouldn't ha want to have happen, but we also know that um, most adults and youth are the recipients of almost 5,000 advertising impressions per day. Mm -hmm. That's TV, you know, logoed clothing, billboards, et cetera, et cetera, pop-up ads, text messages. It's just you're enveloped with it. So when on the, on the uh, intervention side of this study, what we found with those same kids and their parents is over the course of two years, the exact opposite happened. Their materialism measures started declining and their self-esteem measures started rising. So basically our takeaway from that is um, when you equip kids and give them information on kind of what the culture is doing with them in this space, when you help families, you know, more intentionally step into the conversation around a kind of a values-based framework, 
um, it really matters. And so as the wheels of research turn really slowly, um, the study was written up, submitted to a lot of journals, and then just earlier this year in February, it was um, featured in an article in the journal Motivation and Emotion. And then just two months ago, um, Scientific, Scientific American did an article on it because it's, from their kind of vantage point, pretty groundbreaking that you can actually arrest this development. So what that means is it gives us hope. Um, it gives us hope that you can step into the conversation. And that was really the impetus to start creating Money Sanity U to say these little conversations, um, over, when you take the sum total of them over a period of time, matter. They matter a lot. They have a lot of impact. They have a lot of yeah. impact. Yeah. A lot of impact. Not only have you given us a huge amount of content in the 27 minutes that are almost done, um, you've got a great speech rate. You talk really fast, but our crack <laughs> audio staff means that people at home can hear what you're saying. So very, very nice work. But we only have about a minute left. Yeah. Um, so let's make sure that people can access that information yes. easily through your URL. Yeah, cool. So what I would uh, recommend is they visit sharesavespend.com. Uh, they can learn more about our organization, our tools, and then also this new program we're launching called Bunny Santa to You. Okay, wonderful. Well, Nathan, it's been totally a pleasure having you here. Thank you so much, and thank you for your work. You're doing very noble work. Awesome. Thanks, John. Good right. to see you. The pleasure. Yeah. All right, now we sit and we mumble. Yeah. No, no, i got to say goodbye. I suppose we can fix this in post, can't we? <laughs> My guest this week has been Nathan Dungan, president of Share, Save, Spend. That's all we have time for. Come see us next week on the SPNN Forum.